Well, good evening, everyone. We've already started our session with prayer. I forgot to press play, <laughs> press record. And uh, here we are in our Roman study. We're taking up lesson six in Romans part three. And uh, it has been a wonderful week of study and a wonderful week of reflection. We're going to have a great discussion and hopefully uh, somebody else will come into the class tonight. <clears throat> but if not, it's, it's we four. Um, before. Yeah. Maybe after they vote. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. So. Anyway, um, what was I going to say? Oh, we wanted. Uh, so we are going to be uh, focusing today on Romans chapter 10, which was our focus for the week. And. Um, before we do that, let's just do a little uh, review again, because we didn't do that last week. <laughs> okay, so our theme of Romans overall is... Hey, they did it in unison. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and um, from Ro in Romans 1, verses 1 to 17, what do we have? Yes, we have the introduction. And yeah. Yeah. That is. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Sixteen and seventeen. Yes. I'm not ashamed of the Yeah, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, or for faith. For as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. There. For, the wrath of, for the wrath of God is revealed. Heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. That's right. Very good. So there we have that. Uh, the first part of Romans chapter 1 is an introduction and greetings and all of that. And then it goes into the, go the gospel as the power of God for salvation. We learn that it's not just for the Jews, it's also for the Gentiles. Um, then from 18 to, 3, to chapter 320, um, what are our main topics? Well, the depravity of man and uh, God's wrath. That's right. And God's wrath is revealed to all unrighteous. <clears throat> uh, what about righteous? How many are righteous? No one. <laughs> <laughs> Not even one. That's right. Good. Um, we were talking about the new word that we saw, and that was justified, justification. What did we learn in here? In Oh, sorry. In... Um, Romans 3.21 through 5.21 on that topic. God's righteousness is Justification. So, so we, we, uh, by faith, right. And we learn something about law in that. Yeah, that we're not justified by following the law. Yes. That justification comes by faith. Apart from works. Yeah, faith apart from works. Now, um, being justified, what special relationship do we now enjoy? relationship with God through Christ. Mm -hmm. And what does that give us in our spirit? 
the Holy Spirit. Yes, and in our spirit, what what kind of what kind of uh, blessing or benefit do we receive? There are two words I'm looking for. Part of me. Sanctum. Uh, that's I didn't. That wasn't one I was looking for. Well, we received grace. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. That, that's yeah. not the word. I'm. That's still not the word I'm looking for. I've just got to find it. Oh, I went too far. We have. We have peace with God. We have peace with God. Before we were enemies, now we have peace with God. And not only that, but looking forward, we have something else. Everlasting life. Something that doesn't put us to shame. Remember that list? Uh, right at the beginning of five. I thought it was in five. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we've also obtained access by faith into this grace which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. We have hope. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not dis put us to shame or disappoint <laughs> in another version, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. So we believers have hope, and we have peace with God and hope, in, hope of future glory. Okay, let's look at Romans 6 to 8 now. What do we learn about uh, main main things that we learned in Romans 6 through 8? We learn about the resurrection. Yep. Law, law and the spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we died to sin. Yes. What about slavery? I am with Christ and we also live with him. Yes. And so that uh, that dying to sin and dying to the law, uh, what does that result in? The the new word, the new the new doctrine word. Dead to sin and slaves to righteousness. Yes, that's there. So Go ahead, sorry. Believers are released from the law? Yes, and we're released from the law, we're released from the slavery to sin and to the law. What does this result in? Uh, spirit of life compared with the law of spirit of sin and death. Yep. And there was no condemnation. No condemnation. If we were in Jesus Christ. Yes. And the process of living out our new lives is called? Sanctification. Yes, our sanctification. <clears throat> Good. Um, uh, sorry. Also mentioned the problem of the mindset on the 
on the spirit and not on the flesh. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. Uh, can anything separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And there's a nice list there that I memorized once, but I can't remember it. I have to keep re review it because it's a long list. <laughs> okay. What were the problems mentioned in Romans that Paul dealt with in his letter? Uh, think, thinking about the whole of Romans. I think that it was, was certainly, um, I, I think there's an emphasis on the fact that they, they knew of God, the Jews particularly, knew of God, but they didn't know him personally. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't that, well, by the Jews and the Greeks, there was not that acknowledgement of him that... Uh, that, that comes with a relationship. Mm -hmm. There was something particular in Romans 15. Now, we didn't look at Romans 15, but this is a review because we did a long time ago look at it. <laughs> there was something going on in Romans 15 that Paul was um, particularly talking about. God's righteousness displayed. And about the gospel, preaching of the gospel, I think. Uh, yeah, those aren't the problems. What were the problem, though? Oh. He was addressing a problem or some problems. At, or in 16, 15 and 16. 16 is this greetings. Mm, there's pro there. He's addressing. He's addressing some things. All right, let's go specifically to 15 um, verses 14 to 16. Well, oh, I hope I've got 15 in here. Uh, obedience. Oh, and I don't know. Vengeance. Okay, so there's a reason a person writes a letter. They write. We, when I write a letter, it's to uh, share good news or stuff that's going on. Or to ask questions about the other person's life. But Paul, had something he needed to address with people. Hmm. <laughs> Let's uh not pleasing themselves but 15 one we're strong we were strong have an obligation to be able to say things of the week and not to please ourselves so there was obviously some judgment going on here um by the jews particularly um and you know when he goes on to speak about that's not the way of christ that he he did not please himself they were, caused, they were causing division. Yes. There were people causing dissension and division that he wanted to warn about and to instruct uh, in the, you know, how to deal with that and what to do about that. And so we remember, we, we talked about this quite a bit. They were the Judea, Judaizers and the Antinomians. Yeah. So, so tell me what the Judaizers were actually doing. Well, they 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 were elevating themselves because they they figured that they were all right because for the you know for the most part they were they felt they were obeying the law 
And uh, so, and that was all about them. And what were they expecting the Gentile, the new Gentile believers to do? Circumcise. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. They were making that a condition of becoming part of the group, I guess. Belief in God. That was that was kind of the mark. Mm-hmm. What about the antinomians? What what were they doing? Their own thing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, they were. <laughs> so the Jews were all about the law and all of the little uh, rituals and all of that and all of that, the customs and all of that that went with the law. <clears throat> and the antinomians were against the law. Now that grace has come in. And remember how Paul dealt with that. Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? By no means, right? So um, so does does Paul then what does he what does he tell the believers in Rome that they ought to do about these kind of people? Not to all of them. That's right. And to stay away from them. <laughs> Turn away. Turn away from them. Okay, so uh, now we, last week we were taking up Romans 9. And uh, what, you were going to say something? It's all about election. All about election. That's God that they used to elect. Okay. Um, Romans 9, verses 30 to 33. Mm-hmm. You have a question. What shall we say? Well, that's not really the question. Well, that's what it says. This is the question. That's what, the question. <laughs> that's what the question mark is. Yeah. Yeah, but that's not really the question. <laughs> the question is, okay, now I'm in the a different yeah. version. The Gentiles who didn't pursue righteousness, does that mean that uh, they attained righteousness? They didn't. Well, that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is the righteousness that is by faith. But Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. And then there's another question. Why? why? <laughs> uh, yeah, why? So why? They didn't pursue it by faith. As if as if their, their being chosen was because of what they had done by their works. So we understand, looking in retrospect, all of this, we understand reading the history in the Bible, we understand that the Jews didn't choose themselves. God did the choosing. Yeah. Right? And it's, we, we discovered the same is true about us in that lesson. That we didn't actually choose Christ. He chose us and he called us. Because we weren't even looking for him. And he called us. And he chose us. Okay, so that's the funny thing that Paul is bringing up. That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness by faith. Just as Abraham did. Abraham believed God. And then um, we see that uh, Paul had a had a certain emotion going on concerning his uh, his brethren, his family members of um, of the Jews. What was his in in Romans ten? 
Well, in Romans 9, because we were supposed to be comparing Romans 9 and 10. We're not right in there. But in 10, he begins. Yeah, he has a heart's desire that they would be saved. But... Yeah, he wanted them to be saved. Yeah, it's just a... of a God. But not according to knowing and his knowledge. I think that's what that means by not according to knowledge. Mm -hmm. They they didn't know his knowledge. It's like knowing you can know about somebody. But that's different from knowing them. Yeah, that's that's different from being invited into the house to uh, you know play with the family pets and children and eat a meal, right? Yeah. Yes. So Israel tried to make their own way to God based on what they could do. And, and uh, I mean, if you look at cultures now, how different is that from? I said, be honest, I, I don't know whether I'm jumping ahead or not here, but while we were studying this week, that's something that struck me like I've never seen it before. You know, when it speaks, when it asks us to um, think about, uh, let me just see just where we are here. The parallel. Where was that? I think where we were at. Yeah. Um, hmm. Question two, day four. Yeah, this is, uh, it was in uh, question two on day four. It says this is such a vital chapter for by looking at Israel's response to the gospel and the cause of their failure to attain righteousness, you can see why so many religious church going people are lost. Um, and, you know, it's saying ask God to show you how these truths pertain to today. And I never really saw it like I did this week, a parallel between us as Christians and the Jews. Like, I don't know whether you're going to get to that tonight, but... Yeah, yeah, I, go, uh, yeah, we can discuss, we can go wherever you want with that, yeah. It just, I, it just amazed me. I, I'm, I'm writing these things down and I'm thinking, oh my word, because we're all human, right? We're all yes. human. Because we're Christians, we are not perfect. And yeah. we don't have so these were the these were the things that struck me in that study, in that part of the study was there is such a thing as Christian elitism if we're not careful. Like that's the Jews thought they were an elite group. Yeah. And that struck me. I mean, I see that in some, if we're not careful, we can all be like that. Mm -hmm. Attending church because it's the right thing to do. Church is becoming increasingly liberal. Um, ritual. Unbelief. Tradition over relationship or ritual over relationship. You can see that. Yeah or hearing the gospel I, 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 I mean it sounds awful to say that but that is happening in some churches misinterpretation of the scriptures and misrepresentation of the scriptures yes I mean, you oh yes oh yes and yes my girlfriend yeah. so my granny friend in, in Toronto and I she's trying to find a place where she can go freely worship where they're not going to put restrictions upon her because she's healthy and well. Right. And uh, so we've been in a lot of discussion about this kind of thing that um, we've been looking at the statements that some churches have pu published on their websites. And both of us were, were in utter astonishment because if you consider if you read what some of these churches are writing on their websites about who's allowed to come in and who is not, 
you find it very hard to find anything of Jesus in that. And she made a remark about uh, the woman, no, no who, who was it that she, but the one that came to my mind was when Jesus healed the leper, he said, okay, you got to stand over there because you're, you know, you got cooties and you got leprosy and you're not coming in here. Yeah. And we were both together struck by how un-Jesus like these places are. <laughs> You know, especially, you know, and, and, and those ones would say, well, what would Jesus do? <laughs> well, even I'm laughing at this, but it's, 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 it's horrendous. It's horrible. And even in that, we, 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 it's not our place to judge them because God will do that. Yes. But talking about how, what I'm doing anyway is, is seeing the, the, um, parallel the, the 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 likeness here and yeah so we all need to be careful oh indeed um, yeah definitely yeah 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 because well, god is at work everywhere all the time and yes. so even that we're mentioning now um that you know if god is calling the individual all the time and he can use wherever we know that mm -hmm. but anyway just to say just to say uh, we're not so different than the jews <laughs> no 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 because human beings are human beings and uh, you know it, it, and and we all have the tendency towards the flesh we all have you know we are all in process of having the our former lives redeemed and sanctified yeah, yeah. And I you know, and we think we can just be thankful that huh, that God called us to a knowledge of him and that that in itself is humbling. I find the whole thing here humbling, really yeah. humbling. Well, you know, that was the big thing that was going in, on in my heart last week and last week's lesson was in that whole doctrine of election it was it was stupendously humbling yeah 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 and, and that's what and that's good right because that's what god is wanting to do in us hmm. as we as we do studies like this hmm. if we didn't see some of it and, and relate it to ourselves what would be the point of it all? Well, we'd be walking around on some kind of cloud, thinking that we're doing it right all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you know, it, I, I, here is the thing, the thing, the subtle thing, the subtle thing that we're all wrestling with is pride, isn't it? It sneaks in in the most unusual places and rears its ugly head. Yeah. And we don't see, we often don't see our own pride. We don't see it. And when the Lord shows it to us, it's just. Yeah. But at the same time, thankful. Well, yeah. Okay. There was a state, there's a statement in here that I want that uh, the leader guide suggests that we talk about. Okay. So we're in Romans 10. Um, Paul talks about Israel in that they had a great zeal, but it wasn't, as you said, not according to knowledge. Um, and they did not submit themselves to God's righteousness by faith. Uh, there's something about human nature, though, I have to say. You can't just, as you were saying, you there. That that is where we always default to as human beings, don't you think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, every once in a while, God catches us up and says, wait a minute here. That's, that, yeah. I mean, good works are important. They come out of our faith, right? But, uh, yeah. you know, and, and 
well, at least in my life. Okay, so I did that little bit of lobbying <laughs> today, but um, we can get caught up and pursue good things, perfectly good things, perfectly righteous things to do, which are really not the main thing. And the main thing is the gospel and and uh, and preaching the word and discipling people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because even when we even when we um, think we've done the right thing, it's not for us to gloat over that, right? Oh gosh, go back to no. There's no one that's right, righteous. No, not one. And where does it say? Um, even our conscious conscience deceives us when we when we think we're right. Mm -hmm. When we when we kind of gloat over that, I think is what yeah. it means. Yeah. 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 Okay, so um, let me just see what it it has here. Okay, there's the uh, for the Jews. Their zeal was to keep the law, and they did not recognize that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So then there's a note here that says, some interpret Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, that God, that Christ is the goal of the law. So some topics here that we're supposed to talk about. And... Um, here is one. Righteousness is for everyone who believes in Christ. I'm throwing them out. You guys got to discuss. <laughs> There's no one righteous. No, not one. And... Say yeah, like we have to think about because we're told at the same time that we are we are we are righteous by faith or by by grace. Grace makes it's a gift. Mm -hmm. So I think it comes back to that word again. I think Lou is the is the submission. You know. Um, yeah, we have to submit ourselves to the Lord and believe what his word says about righteousness, what that really means. Mm. It's not because of our own work. But we are made Christ, we are made righteous by our faith in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because remember, we studied that Christ's righteousness is imputed to us because of, so that's an imputation by the father so the father now reckons us righteous because of our faith in christ I, I, the way we I don't always it, sorry go ahead he he to me he sees us through jesus it's like it's like we're covered mm -hmm. it's with jesus so God sees sees us through Jesus. That makes sense. That's mm -hmm. the whole picture. Mm -hmm. Sees us through the blood, the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And what that we have nothing to do with that, except except to believe it and to. Accept Jesus as the one who did that for me. Mm -hmm. Accept that that's enough. When he said it is finished, it's paid in full. To accept that that is that's it. That's what it is. And it seems really simplistic in a way. It does. Because it is. Yes, because <laughs> it is. Yeah. But there are many. I think because they know about Christ, they think they're okay. 
but they don't have the righteousness oh. of Christ's faith. Okay. They don't have the righteousness of faith, by faith. Just like the Israelites, they thought they were okay because they were so-called descendants of Abraham. Mm -hmm. And the promise to Abraham. And Jacob. Mm -hmm. But not all, I think in, in chapter 9 says that not all who call themselves Israelites are Israelites. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm saying. So look, it's the same with Christians. If there's a lot to call themselves Christians, but they're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then, yeah. okay, so then. That. So then, again, we come back to the problem that Paul was having or he was observing uh, in the churches about the uh, Judaizers and the, and what were they called? Antinomians. Antinomians. And then, I, I, then I think, well, he, the Lord planted the seed and the tares grew up and, uh, and, the, the servant said, well, we should rip out the tares. And he said, no, because you'll rip out the wheat too. So they grow both mm -hmm. together. That is in the end. Yes, in the end. Yeah. So it's not our job to do the gathering, harvest, and burning, right? <laughs> no. Okay. Zeal and salvation. So he... He makes up the he makes the argument or the excuse me, the observation that the Jews had great zeal for the law. They had great zeal for God. But the zeal and the salvation are not the same. No. So you can be a you could be as zealous about anything. You could be zealous about your hobby. <laughs> yeah. The Jehovah's Witness have great zeal. Yes, they do. For God. <laughs> but I don't think they're saved. Because they don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And God in the flesh, right? They may they may even say, Oh yeah, I believe he's maybe one of the sons of God or whatever. But they don't believe, they definitely will tell you they don't believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. Yeah. He is God in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they have the zeal. It doesn't mean they have salvation. Mm -hmm. oh. And the Mormons also have zeal, sending out their missionary. The Mormons have zeal in sending out their missionaries all the time. And they live, they, you know, they're family oriented as God designed, most of them. <laughs> and their values are good values. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what did what did Paul say about in particularly he was talking about this topic with reference to the Jews? They had a zeal without what did you say before, Maureen? Without knowledge. Yes. Yeah. Did anybody do a word study on knowledge? Just out of I don't think I did. No, I didn't. Okay. I did but not that. Yeah, you know that might be a that might be an interesting thing to get a little more insight on, on the word that that is used there for that for knowledge. I didn't either. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, verses five through thirteen in chapter ten. In his reasoning about Israel and salvation, who did Paul quote? No, Moses. Mm -hmm. Why did he do that? You suppose? Moses was the one that gave the law from God to the people. 
which you're going to quote sucking in the law, then you're referencing Moses. Mm -hmm. So Paul is appealing to um, appealing to uh, the Jewish believers um, using Moses because he was the the highly respected by them. Using the scripture. Yeah. And highly respected. Using the is that recognized, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, think about it. Uh, Paul was writing the New Testament. There wasn't one yet. <laughs> right? Oh. Yeah. Talking to them about stuff that they... Mm -hmm. So uh, Romans 2 and 7 contain Paul's earlier reasoning or teaching about the law. So what did we learn about the law in those chapters? Chapter 2. 2 and 7. Oh. 2, yeah, chapter 2 and chapter 7. We, um, we learned that the law was given to show what sin is. That was one of the things that we learned in those chapters. Um, it says, it says that the uh, all the all have sinned under the law, all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Yes. And didn't we learn that uh, if you break even one part of the law, you're guilty of it all? Yeah. Yeah, all 613 rules. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. So what about the law itself? Is is the law um, um well no he makes a statement I don't want to say ask that question. I'm just going to state and then you can tell tell me what what he states some certain qualities about the law in earlier chapters, in those chapters. Mm -hmm. What does he say about the law? The qualities of the law. Speaks about it being written on the heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, he also talks about the Gentile who didn't know the law, but by nature they did what the law would require. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm not really describing what I want to say. The nature, the character of the law. It is holy. That's right. And? Oh, okay. And righteous. And? Good. Yes, the law is holy and righteous and good. God gave it, so it must be holy and righteous and good. Right? <laughs> so we're not dispensing with the law. Because it's holy and righteous and good. This is a this is one to really this this whole topic is um, take is a there's a lot of meditating to do on that and, and to puzzle through and ask the Lord for His um in you know to give us wisdom and understanding. Okay, so what was the problem with the law as far as the Jews were concerned then? The law doesn't need salvation. That's right. And could they keep it? Hmm. Oh. That's why no, that's why they had to make sacrifices all the time, right? Yeah. So so when God is talking about righteousness and he is righteous and the law is righteous, now what is he? What is the righteousness that God speaks of in terms of the law? It's, you know, this is not a hard answer. We've, we've given this over and over tonight already. 
<laughs> I'm just coming at it with a trying to come around it at a different angle. So the so let me reiterate the recap here. The the law is holy and righteous and good, but the problem with the Jews was they might have kept the letter and then used sacrifice, but what about their hearts? Their heart. Their heart wasn't there. Yeah, they didn't keep it from their hearts. And that's why the prophets were, were given the word, then then the Lord told the prophet that uh, that he would give them a heart of flesh for a heart of stone. And and that was accomplished in Christ. And they would that he would give us hearts to obey him. That he'd write the law, as you said, Maureen, they'd write the law on our hearts. Okay, so um, in Romans 10, verses 6 to 8, what's that about? Righteousness is based on faith. Mm -hmm. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Mm -hmm. What about Christ? <clears throat> well, he says uh, that righteousness is based on faith. And do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Says the word is near you in your mouth and your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Mm. And so, in terms of the righteousness of God, is there who can do what Christ did? No one. So only Christ could do that. And so here you you just were mentioning about uh, you can't bring him down from heaven. Because that's what God did to demonstrate his righteousness. And we can't raise, you know, we can't bring him up from the dead because that's what God did to show his righteousness. Um, what, are, what are the quotes? So we have some quotes in verses 6 to 8. Deuteronomy 30, verses 12 to 14. Do we? Mm. Well, I'm just going to tell you what it is. Deuteronomy 30, 12 to 14. Hmm. I'm going to start at 11. For this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it. But the word of, is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. Yeah, that's what uh, that's what uh, uh, he was quoting there. So, what does this what does this passage then tell us about um, man's power and ability to produce righteousness? Huh. Doesn't have any power to produce righteousness. Oh. We can't produce it. That's right. So, yes, so God gave Christ as the end of the law. And he did everything that was needed for our righteousness, for righteousness, period. Mm. Okay, verse 8 is another Old Testament quote about the word of faith. So what about this word of faith? What do we learn in Romans 10? 
verse 8. It's in your mouth and in your heart. Mm -hmm. So if it's in your mouth and in your heart, is it in your doing? Yeah. And that's probably what profane means. It's not just mouthing it, is it? It's your actions as well. Living, living that life of faith. Um, it is about seeking it, but like you say, it, it's about it's about your actions too. I guess. I guess what uh, what the lesson here is suggesting to me to to you is that um actually we we live out our faith but i don't think that's what we're, we're talking about here we don't we don't drum up our own faith we don't earn our own faith there's nothing no. we, we can do about our faith except believe the word that was given to us yeah mm -hmm. yes yeah. so the word of faith the gospel is near us it's in our mouths in our heart it's been spoken to us so how did paul explain what he meant by this how is a person saved in this passage verse 9. Yeah, yeah. Passion was one. Leave in your heart the best with your mouth. Mm. Yeah. And calling on the Lord. Through the down, it talks about calling on the Lord. Mm -hmm. so everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Will be saved. Yes. 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 So I guess what the point that they wanted mm -hmm. to make, too, is that um, it's not an order of things, although it says there's, you know, it says, uh, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It doesn't mean that there's an order to that, like do this and then that. Oh. Both are acknowledging that Jesus was raised from the dead but also confessing him as Lord. So tell, tell me what we learned about that. There's no distinguishing, distinction between Greek and Jew. Mm -hmm. For the name of the Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the word study on Lord. Yeah. Lord is, is Lord is master. That usage of Lord right there is about master, sir, a person exercising absolute ownership rights. It's from, it's curious from the word cura, which means authority, one in authority. And the same, the same uh, word is the use of Jesus and of God, God the Father. Okay. It's the same word in, in this context. And the word confess, I found interesting too. Um, it, it was to speak the same, to agree. And from a root word meaning together, uh, two root words meaning together, and to speak a speak to a conclusion. So, in other words, to voice the same conclusion. He <coughs> thinks. So, when we confess, we're speaking what God's already spoken, because we believe it. And uh, there's a bit of this, the, the, the under, when you confess uh, that Jesus is Lord, it is an admission, an acknowledgement 
a submission that he owns you. He, he's your master, right? Sorry, mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> Bob says it's only thunder at our house. <laughs> it's rolling again. So, so then uh, let's say it again. What does it mean to confess Jesus as Lord? If we had to explain it to someone who just absolutely does not know. You were subjected to, to, subjected to him. How would you explain it to somebody who doesn't know him? Well, the result of your life is to become subjected. Mm-hmm. That's the way I would put it. Mm-hmm. You want me to read what it says in the book? <laughs> <laughs> Confessing means your mouth can only speak what's already in your heart. I think it's in James where it talks about you know, what comes from your mouth comes from your heart. Oh, right. And so if the Christ is not in your heart, you can't speak honestly that Jesus is Lord, the supreme authority in your life. Yeah, and so this is the issue I have had for a long time. Remember, Jesus said many in that day will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And and I will say to you, get away from me. I never knew you. So to me, There are probably a lot of counterfeits walking around who talk a good talk, who, you know, walk a decent walk, what we can see. Uh, There may be even people doing miracles in the name of Jesus. Um, But I don't think really that's anything for us to bother about, do you? I mean, it's it's not for me to bother about whether, I don't know. Paul is addressing the issue of dissension and, and, you know, stuff like that going on in the church is causing division. But I guess, I guess, you know, And I noticed this in Christian music, especially Christian pop music. If you were listening to the words without without knowledge of Christ, some of those songs wouldn't even necessarily need to have a a a Christian theme because some of them them, some of them could apply to anybody. Yeah. And so for me, there are many people who can talk about God. And they can mean whatever whatever they mean in their mind, in their heart about God. And so then you get three people talking about God, and this person has a different idea about God. This person has a different idea about God. This person has a three different understandings or experiences of what they mean when they say God but only the one who confesses Jesus as Lord is is saved when you speak with people when you speak with people of different faith um, that's the part that's the one thing that that delineate is the fact that all of them will will say, or oh, the ones I've spoken to anyway, and I haven't spoken to multitudes, don't get me wrong, but I've spoken with a few different from different religions. And all of them would deny the fact that Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is 
is it was God in the flesh. He was God walking on earth. And uh, they just don't believe that. And so there's where, there's the, there's the, the line right there. Because it says, unless you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you won't be saved. There's no other way to salvation. There's no other way. Mm-hmm. And and for some people that you know it seems what that seems elitist in itself, but that's not my word. That's what the, that's what the word of God says. Yes. So I have um, I have concerns about people who cannot say the name of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know that 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 uh, chorus, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. You know, you get into conversations with people, some of them in Christian circles, and they cannot name the name of Jesus. And I find that very concerning. Uh, you know, well, anyway, I'll, I'll just keep that to myself. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm going to read what it says here. The confession of Jesus as Lord means the acknowledgement that Jesus is God, that he shares God's name, nature, holiness, authority, and power. Jesus and God are one. He is the master, the one who has supreme authority in one's life. And whether we acknowledge him or not, he still does. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. It doesn't change. Yeah. I was just going to ask now what what are the results of confessing and believing then? What did we learn? You're justified. Yeah. So when we confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord. We are saved. We'll be the but raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. saved. Yes, yes. Believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. That's uh, that when we believe that, that's what God considers to be righteousness. God accounts to us as righteousness, and we are justified then in His sight. And that word "saved" is. Is loaded really. I, I I looked at it. I know that it means sozo, and sozo to me is being healed, saved, and delivered. But when you look it up, it's even more than that. Preserve, rescue. It says properly to deliver out of danger and into safety. Principles of God: rescuing believers from the penalty of sin. And into a provision. Isn't that awesome? Yes. Yeah. It's awesome. He's our rescuer. Yes. Yeah. He doesn't only deliver us out of danger, but he takes us into safety. He brings us into a safe place. That's a that's why I keep saying first Peter one five. Yoo-hoo, yoo-hoo, you who are protected by the power of God. <laughs> I mean, you have to read the rest of that chapter, First Peter 1, but um, yeah. Um, what did we learn uh, uh, from Romans 10, verse 11, 9, verse 33, and the Isaiah 28, verse 16? What did we find there? Ten eighteen. Yeah. What might I want? Have they not? Yeah. Um, Ten sixteen. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, "Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us?" Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And that goes into 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, whoever believes in Christ has hope. And hope does not disappoint. Mm -hmm. Beautiful thing. Um, so we know that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And um, is he stingy? <laughs> no. Definitely not. No, no, no. So I'm just thinking of the phrase, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. With, yeah, for all who call upon him. So what does it mean to call upon his name? This, okay, so this comes back to my curiosity, my lifelong curiosity that I've had. <clears throat> what is your name? What does that mean to call upon your name? So what do we learn? What does it mean to call upon his name? Based on the, uh, the context of verses 9 to 13 there. Call on his name. Um, that has to do with worship. The word call has to do with uh, with worship. Has to do with believing in your heart that Jesus is. Because if you don't believe in your heart, you're not going to be able to call the name. And when you do call on him, it is it is a form of worship. When somebody calls out to be delivered from their sin, it's a form of worship. Yes, because they know because it's an acknowledgement of Yes, that they he know that you can do it. Yes, that he's the deliverer. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's about worship and deliverance, right? Yes. Worship and salvation. Yeah. 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 One, of, one of the things I wrote there in that section is that uh, we must know that not only is Christ the martyr, he is also known as the victor. Ah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So when we call upon the name, we are acknowledging that Jesus is our Lord, our master, and that, that that's the rightful relationship. That's the right, po rightful position between us and God. He owns us. Yeah. Yeah. He owns us. Okay, and so uh, here's the thing, you know, I, we were having this little, were we having this discussion last week? Uh, oh, or maybe it was with somebody else I was uh, having this. They were talking about um, what I would call lifestyle evangelism and, and hoping that people will come to know Christ by our example. What do you say about that? They have to hear the word preached to them, the gospel preached to them to come to the Lord. Because that's what the rest of the chapter talks about. Yes. Yes. So, it, so we are to be a good example. We are to, but is that enough? Not that one, we're one doing other, it. Sorry, go ahead. Um, one of the other things I wrote uh, was that man must not only believe in his heart, he must confess with his lips. Christianity is a belief plus confession. It involves witness before men, not only God, but also our fellow men must know whose side we are on. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, today I got my nails done. What a wonderful thing. They were a mess. And I was able to witness to Jesus, uh, you know, 
testify of Jesus in this situation that we live in in this world to the girl who was doing my nails. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And it and it, okay. it wasn't anything belabored or anything. It was just this is I believe this is what I believe. And you know, I mean, I could tell she's already soft towards faith. She was talking about, you know, her she she was we were talking about the storm and I told her how I was praying all the promises of God I knew <laughs> when I was sitting by the window because it was not a normal natural storm. <laughs> and I was just kept I just kept telling God what what I knew about him from the Psalms that my sister and I have learned by, about his name that that we learned in another study. I just kept praying those things back to him. And I wasn't afraid of the storm, but it was, you know, and so she was telling me about her little girl couldn't sleep last night because of that awful storm. And she said, and I didn't know the Bible. I said, I can't tell you the Bible verses, you know, to help her little girl. Right. Anyway, but you know, it's, yeah, but you know, that opened a door that opened a door. That's right. And it's about taking those opportunities, I guess. We had a similar experience when we were walking to the school and we spoke with Peter. Oh, yeah. 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 Our neighbor is, um, I guess he's overseeing some construction work that's going on in town on, on the road. And uh, we were out walking and, and uh, met him and had the opportunity to chat with him then and, and share something about about Jesus. And so sometimes sometimes it is about speaking speaking that way. But I do think sometimes too that um, that the example, showing by example, living by example, um, is something that causes people to ask questions sometimes I guess well I have to say that it's never it's never that living with God's help a, a righteous life has never opened the door for me to speak to anybody but yeah. but but listening to like in conversations about what you know about what life is that's what opens the door when you hear yeah. what well, I guess that's what I'm like it's how you live your life. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not discrediting yeah. or or dis, I'm not disagreeing uh, with that at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so basically, acknowledging Jesus Christ as our Lord and Master, and confessing that with our mouth, saying that. Not hiding it under a bushel, hiding it in the closet, you know, talking behind our hand. No, that is calling upon the name of the Lord. <clears throat> so uh, verses 14 and 15 in this chapter, what were Paul's next questions in the text? Because this is... This... Yeah. No, 14. 14 and 15. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? That's, that's exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. How's your feet doing? <laughs> uh -huh. Beautiful feet. Uh, that was one of the themes at girls camp one year. Beautiful feet. <laughs> How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. So yeah. how does the quote in verse 15 relate to the progression in questions? Preach yeah, how does that, how does that, okay, what's the, the quote is, how beautiful? How beautiful are the, the feet, feet of those who are, 
to preach the good gospel news. of peace. Yes. Okay. So, how does that quote relate to the progression that we just that you just read, Yanis? Um, people won't hear unless someone is sent. Uh, because it says in 14, how are they to believe in him of who they've never heard? But if somebody doesn't go and tell them, they'll never know. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the people who are sent with good news have beautiful feet. <laughs> And people believing the word of faith um, starts with people like Paul being sent with it, with good news. And so then, then when people hear it, then they know who to call upon for salvation. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> Let's look in verses uh, 16 and 17. What happened to Israel? Mm. They didn't they didn't obey, they didn't heed it, they didn't believe the word. So Paul quoted from another Old Testament writer held in high esteem by Jews, Isaiah the prophet. What what did he say about in Romans 9 verse 6? There was a question, a rhetorical question that he that he asked to make a statement. Did they, okay, go ahead. He said, uh, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. No, nine, six. That is, oh, sorry, that's 10. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. But it's not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, to so when Isaiah preached the preached the gospel in the Old Testament. Did God's word fail? Oh. Okay, so we were just talking, we were just talking about um, they can't hear, uh, uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and you can't believe unless you hear it, and you can't hear it unless someone is sent, right? And so the, the question back there was, did the does that mean the word of God has failed? That it never failed. That Israel did not believe. So, so what was the issue? It was that Israel didn't believe. It they're, wasn't they're that, stubborn now. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. God failed. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, let's go back. Um, in okay, so we're looking. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of God. That's verse seventeen, right? So. So let's go through the progression. So you have faith comes by hearing. I hear the preacher preach. And what is it that we're hearing preached? The good news. And who, the good news of, of what? Of who? Jesus. Jesus. Good news. good news about Jesus, right? And so... So, so someone is sent with that gospel, the word of Christ, and then someone hears that, and then that one hears that and believes it and is saved. And they confess what they're mm -hmm. So I guess here's, here's, a, here's a, a discussion. Uh, encourage your group to discuss how important the gospel is. They need to know what they're to do with it. The preacher. <laughs> tell people about Jesus. Get on the street corner on your box. <laughs> 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 
It says somebody has to send you. Well, who sends us? God sent us. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So none of us have an excuse, right? Because <laughs> we're in the corner of the world in which he's placed us. All right. So we know what to do. I hope the people out there in YouTube land know what to do. Just talk about Jesus. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them all about Jesus. All right, verses 18 to 21. Um, what is Paul's reasoning question and the answer to it? He asks if they have, haven't heard. And what's the answer to that? They have indeed heard. <laughs> yes, indeed they have. So what does he quote then? I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Yeah, and so, then it yeah. Says like, yeah. so the Gentiles' goal is to make Israel jealous. Right. Because of our relationship yeah. with God. Wants to be the other way around, right? That's the way it was meant to be. Yes, yes. What were you saying, Yanis? I was going to say it says in Isaiah was supposed as bold as to say, "I have been found by those who did not seek me, and I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me." That's us. <laughs> Yeah. All day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So how does that go back to Romans chapter one, eighteen to twenty? That the passage where really he turns them over to their own desires. I think that's a little far ahead. That's real without excuse in verse twenty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because God has made himself known. With invisible attributes, mainly the eternal power and divine nature, has been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they would have excuse. Mm -hmm. So... The reasoning question in verse 19 of chapter 10, because we're in those 18, yeah, we're there in chapter 1, but now in chapter 10, verse 19. Did Israel not understand? Well, what's the answer to that? I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. Of a fooling nation or will make you angry. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they knew. Did they understand? Yeah. Did they understand? Mm. Oh. What did Moses and Isaiah both, how did Moses and Isaiah both describe Israel? A foolish nation. And you already said this, Yanis, once. I've been found by those who did not seek me. That's us. How did it, how did the... I, I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. Yeah. That's us. Okay. How, yeah, how, how did the, how, how were Israel 
described though by the prophets. All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Mm -hmm. Very few. Yes. Disobedient, obstinate, contrary. <clears throat> and Isaiah said that the Gentiles, we found him, God, even though we didn't really seek him. That's an amazing thing. So what does that mean about God's plan? Go forward no matter what. Yes. And who does it include? All that believe. All 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 the, everyone. everyone, not just the Jews. God's plan always included the Gentiles. You know, because even even in old even in Old Testament times, I mean, people who believed in the God of Israel um, could be accepted into the faith. God did not exclude anyone who wanted to come to him, even before Christ. All right. It says here, compare verses 20 to 21 with Romans 9, 30 to 32. We've just talked a lot. We've just, it's a reiteration again of what we've just talked about. Yeah, it's Gentiles didn't seek him, but they found him, mm -hmm. and they were made righteous. Yes, by faith. Mm -hmm. And Israel, who did pursue by different means, stumbled. Mm -hmm. They were yeah disobedient, obstinate, contrary. Even though God stretched out His arms to them all day long. And so then we've talked about this earlier in the lesson, the God's intent about about saving Gentiles was to do something, cause something in the Jews. Jealousy. Yes. Yes. Well, think about it. I mean, think about that. Think about that in a family sense the same kind of idea not that you have a chosen child or anything like that but um if if one is honored above the other the tendency is for the other to get jealous for what has been given and you know or bestowed upon the one who's who's being blessed and, and so, uh, so it's not just all the Gentiles. It's it's the ones who heard, and who heeded, and obeyed the gospel. Right. So, um, so we go back to the beginning of this chapter again, and we see that Paul's heart was really uh, yearning strongly that Israel would be saved. Oh, excuse me, that his brethren of the Israelites would be saved. And um, there are some questions here, and I don't have any doubt in my mind <laughs> about these, but the questions that I want to read into the record for the YouTube people are these. Have you called upon the name of the Lord? Have you acknowledged that Jesus is Lord? Do you really believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Because if so, you're saved. Amen. Simple as that. And that is the desire of our hearts that you should be saved, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile. Whatever religion you may have practiced before, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Confess with your mouth that he is Lord. And get yourself into a good Bible study. 
where you be where you'll be discipled and where people can keep track of you and where you have accountability to live out your faith it's so important so important anyway what about Israel today well there's, uh, there's Jewish people coming to the Lord all the time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So God's hands are still outstretched. That's the beautiful thing. I heard as a little child that God's hands, Jesus' hands, are always outstretched to say, come, come. So if you hear his voice today, come. As long as you have today, while it is today, come, come to Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for showing us your plan of salvation. We understand thoroughly in our hearts that there is no one righteousness, no, not even one. That none of our righteousness means anything at all. It's just as filthy rags to you. And the only way that you consider us righteous is by simple, honest belief in Jesus, your Son, the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Father God, I just pray that you would use this study and this word to speak to hearts and minds who are questioning and just speak so quietly and simply, come. Come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Oh, Lord, you are the Prince of Peace. So many people are living in such terrible um, stress. I pray that you would walk alongside them, Prince of Peace, and show them your, your salvation, that you would you would save all who call out upon your name in spirit and in truth from their hearts to the praise and the glory and the honor of your name O mighty one of israel we pray amen, amen. well you guys this has been a really great study and so I'm going to say goodbye to our YouTube family out there. I keep forgetting where the camera is. There you are. <laughs> anyway, um, if you have any comments, questions, you can write them in in the comment section of this YouTube. Um, uh, you can also go to my website, which is there, and fill out the form if you want to dis make any further discussions. We welcome that. And uh, just... Let's pray God's blessing on you, his richest blessing. See you later. See you next time. Lesson mm -hmm. seven. Two more lessons in this mm -hmm. in this session. So we'll see you later. Bye. Two or three.